Amen. All right, we're going to jump right into it. Genesis chapter number 17 tonight. We're going to begin reading here again in verse number 1. Genesis 17, verse 1 reads, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Let's stop right there and touch on a couple of things we read there in verses 1 through 4. First off, we see now that Abram is 99 years old. It says in verse 1, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9. So he's 99 years old now, and what, when, what we're reading right now is taking place. Now, if you remember... Verse 16 of the previous chapter tells us that Abram was four score, so that's 80, and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So now we have, we're jumping forward another 13 years. So now we have many years that has gone by again, and now he is 99 years old, and God appears unto him again. We were talking even last the last chapter about how long had went by in the first place when he had appeared unto him around, he was around 70 before that, so 16 years uh, in total, went by the first period of time when he was waiting on, you know, uh, this promise of God. He was wandering about, you know, as a stranger in the land of Canaan, and God only had appeared unto him once, uh, you know, actually three times total, I believe. He had sacrificed to God a few different times, but that's a long period of time, and how he had to keep up his patience, and he had to be faithful throughout this period of time. But we see now. Another 13 years has gone by. That's a long time. So we have to kind of gain. We have to step back and really, you know, uh, uh, look at the whole lifespan of Abraham, uh, Abram at this time, and understand, you know, uh, what he's going through and the decisions he's making, and it'll give you more of an idea of why he does what he does. Not to justify anything, but it makes more sense from a human perspective sometimes when he has faults and things like that. So 13 years had went by. Again, he's 99 years old, and it tells you the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Turn to Exodus chapter number 6. Exodus chapter number 6. Exodus chapter number 6. Now, he says there, I am the Almighty God. Jehovah's Witnesses have this argument that they use from a verse in Psalms that they totally misunderstand where, you know, they're trying to teach that his name alone is Jehovah saying like that's the only name that he has. No, it's saying he's the only one with that name. Like he's the only one that has the name Jehovah because he is the, what it's saying is because Jehovah means Lord or ruler. He is the, he is the Lord of Lords basically. He is the Lord. That's what that verse actually means by saying his name alone is Jehovah. Now, they have this doctrine that they teach that the only name that God has is Jehovah. Well, look here in, in Exodus chapter number 6 when God appears unto Moses, before Moses actually goes and leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Verse 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. So we're reading about that, aren't we, right now, when he appeared unto Abraham. Now look what it says. By the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. What does that mean? It means he's got two names. He said, when I appear unto them, I appear by my name God Almighty. And then he says, but by my name Jehovah was I not known unto them. Saying he has two names. He was only known by one of them at that time, but by, by the name Jehovah at that point, when he's speaking to Abraham, what we're reading about right now in Genesis 17 he was not known by the name Jehovah. So what we're reading right here when it says, go back to Genesis 17, verse 1, when God says, I am the Almighty God, that is his name. That is one of his names, Almighty God, according to Exodus chapter number 6, what we just read. So this is God's name that the Bible's telling you, or when God is speaking specifically, I am the Almighty God. That is equivalent to one of God's names. It's referred to as one of God, God's names. God says this afterwards there in verse 1. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now the word perfect, we're not going to look up a definition because we've done this multiple times since the, the, the church has began here and since March of last year. But the word perfect means complete. 
Bible talks about, you know, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So you're not lacking anything is what that means. You can be entire, perfect, complete. That's what that means, that you're not lacking anything. It does not mean, you know, that God wants Abraham, or Abram, as I said this time, to be sinless. That's not what he's saying. He wants him to be complete. So he says, walk before me and be thou perfect. Also, we know Job was referred to as a perfect and upright man, saying he's complete. He doesn't have any major flaws in his life. He's a well-rounded Christian. Look at verse 2. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, as far as his covenant being given to Abram, or Abraham, has that already taken place? It has, hasn't it? So a lot of people will misinterpret this verse. They'll, they believe, especially people that you know, um, believe maybe in a work salvation. That Abram had to continue you know, doing good works and he could lose the covenant, right? Well, that's not the case. We, number one, we know we can't lose our salvation. You know, the whole Bible teaches you can't lose your salvation. That's just a stupid interpretation, right? But if we go back, just flip back to Genesis 15. <clears throat> I pointed out a couple of things because I knew that this was going to become relevant in, in uh, later subsequent chapters like what we're in now. <clears throat> I want you to look in Genesis 15. This is when... Uh, Abram actually was saved when he, you know, uh, was, was, uh, was saved. Look at uh, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I'm going to read kind of quickly through here. Just try to follow me. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Now watch this. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Does it sound like he's questioning right now whether he's going to you know, give this covenant or whether he's made this covenant with Abraham or Abram at this point? No, of course not. Look at verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said, said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Does this sound questionable? No, not at all. You know, of course, he believed the Lord in verse 6, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Verse 7, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur, the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. Now watch verse 8, how clear this is. And he said, Lord God, whereby, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So he's saying, how, how am I going to know that what you're saying really is true? Now look what God says. I mean, it's as clear as can be. And he said to him, you know, take me and have for He tells him to prepare this sacrifice, right? Verse 13, you know, there's a vision that he sees, and then it says this. And he said unto Abram, God speaking out of the vision, no of a surety. Look at this. No of a surety. Saying this is for certain. This is going, the covenant has already really been made at this point. It's already been made. Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. He goes on and on, explains all this prophecy that's going to take place. Verse 18, in the same day the Lord, look at this, made a covenant with Abram. The covenant has already been made. The covenant has already been made at this time. Now go back with that in mind and look again at, G at Genesis 17. Verse 2. And I'll give you my interpretation of this. So he tells him at the end of verse 1, actually, Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And then he says this in verse 2, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now what is the covenant? It's him having the child, isn't it? Right? It's him that he's going to have a seed. Well, this is, I believe, the, I believe this is a, the only real option when you look at this. He's telling him, Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Thirteen years has went by since the last time he appeared unto him, and almost a total of, what, 20 years at this point and since he called him originally. He made the covenant as far as the agreement 13 years before this when he was saved, or, or longer than that actually, 15 years roughly, when he was actually saved. And now he's telling him, walk before me and be thou perfect, and, I'll, and he's saying basically, I will make this happen as far as allowing you to have the seed. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and right now, I'm going to bring this to pass. I'm going to make the covenant actually come to pass. And it's going to happen either way. He's saying, Don't walk before me. This is what I want you to do right now for me, and I'm going to bring the covenant to pass. Because you know what actually happens in this chapter? 
He actually brings it to pass. So the covenant that was already made, it's going to happen. He told them, know of a surety that thy seed you know, will go into another nation, and they're going to be you know, strangers, and they're going to serve them. He, this has already been prophesied. God's word will not fail. It will happen no matter what. There's no going back. Abram saved already. Salvation, you can't lose it. I mean, these are all very basic principles in the Bible. And then we see him come to him and he says, walk before me and be thou perfect, and I'll make my covenant with you. You know what he's telling him? I'll make it happen right now. You've been waiting this period of time. Right now, if you walk before me and be thou perfect, I'll make it happen right now. You know what happens? It comes to pass after this. Look at what happened right there, too. And, and further proof of this is what we read here in just a couple of verses. Look at verse 3. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, watch this. As for me, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Notice how it just says, it was, it was already there. As for me, because they had already made the agreement. And right now he's saying, it's, it's, he's making it coming, it's, he's causing it to come to pass right now. My covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And he's getting ready to explain that he's going to cause the covenant that was already between them to come to pass. Look at verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but, the, but thy name shall be Abraham. <clears throat> For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now, as I already mentioned, we looked at Genesis chapter number 15 was where um, you know, his salvation took place. Now, this is very, very important you know, uh, to spend time on for just for a brief second. We looked at this before, but I want to look at it again. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 4, just because this is uh, brought up a couple of different times. We're going to look at it two, at this passage twice tonight. We're going to turn here two different times tonight. And I want to, because this is good ammunition that you can use to people to help people explain salvation in the Old Testament, that it wasn't by works, all different types of things like that. <clears throat> I want you to understand that before Abram or Abraham was uh, circumcised, he was already saved. He had already been given righteousness. I want you to look at Romans chapter number 4. Look at verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Now pay close attention. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. Now, I know we've looked at that a couple of times already. Go back to Genesis chapter number 17. And if you look at the latter portion of this chapter, uh, beginning in verse number 10, he actually, at this point, tells Abram that he wants him to you know, uh, perform the sign of, of circumcision, the token, uh, really a token of his righteousness that he had, according to Romans 4. Before he was circumcised, he already had this righteousness. He had already believed on the Lord. So, is this him getting saved? No, let's use Romans chapter 4. Let's use the New Testament even further to interpret this passage. And what does it tell you? That he had already had righteousness given to him at what moment? Genesis 15. He didn't need to keep getting it. That's why it references, yeah, when he believed in the Lord, he was counted as him for righteousness. He already had it. Then he's circumcised afterwards. And Romans 4 says, yeah, that's actually a sign of his you know, righteousness, which he had yet being uncircumcised, the Bible says. So we may look at that one more time, or maybe I'll just reference it again. I want you to look there at, um, so we saw verse 5, his name is changed to what we refer to him as, you know, which is Abraham. His name is changed from Abram to Abraham, and the Bible always tells you what their names mean. So look at verse 5 again, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram. But thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So the name Abraham means father of many, or father of many nations. So look at verse 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. So that's a very interesting statement. There's obviously a spiritual and a physical application to that. Many phys Physically, how many kings came out of him? Tons, tons of kings came out of him. I mean, obviously the whole line of all of those of Israel, right? Just tons of kings. 
And then you have the line being split and two kingdoms being established. So think of all the many, many kingdoms, all the many, many times that this was fulfilled through Abraham in the physical aspect, right? Well, I want to focus on about three verses here, and I want to look at the spiritual aspect of those kings, and I also want to look at the spiritual aspect of verses 7 and 8. So look at verse 7 now. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to the, excuse me, and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan, and then he says this, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Now, I, I referenced or alluded to Acts 7, and I believe we even looked at it one time, where it talks about how Abraham, while he was on this earth, was not given even so much as to set his foot in as far as the property goes in Canaan. This promise right here is very clear that he says in verse 8, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. But then Acts 7 tells us that he never received this land at all. Now, I want to I show you from the Bible the exact parallel fulfillment of this passage, where it's, where it's quotations repeatedly of this particular passage in these three verses right here. Now, first, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 11. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. There's, of course, a temporary or a physical fulfillment of this which took place with the nation of Israel going in. And this was just a foreshadowing. This was not the true or overall fulfillment. <clears throat> but when the nation of Israel was led in by Joshua into the land of Canaan, they possessed that land, didn't they? But that was a temporary possession. They were kicked out, weren't they? Because it was based upon what? The covenant of the law. Now, the covenant of the law and the covenant of grace are two totally different covenants, aren't they? Now, notice the covenant that was just given to Abraham. Was it, was it um, you know, once Abraham had received this, was there any sort of, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like any other requirements or conditions? That's what I'm looking for. Was it condi conditional once he had received the covenant? Was it something that he could lose? No, it said it was an everlasting possession. I'm going to give it to you and to your seed for what? For an everlasting possession. What did God specifically say about the land when he took Israel in? What did he say? If you do this, you turn away from me, you don't keep my commandments, what am I going to do? I'm going to kick you out of the land. Notice these are two total, they're polar opposites, aren't they? It's the exact, they're, they're two totally different things. Because you have the covenant of the law, which is conditional, and then you have the covenant of grace, which is permanent. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you receive the land, you have it forever. You know, and obviously we, while we're in this fleshly body, we haven't inherited the land in its fullest sense. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I can never lose my salvation. I'm going to live in Canaan forever no matter what. Amen. I just haven't made it there yet. But I'm going to be there. So there are two different things. One is permanent. One can be temporary. Now, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter number 11 where it talks about Abraham. And it talks about him seeking this land. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. So sojourn is like temporarily staying somewhere. You're visiting. It's not your land is what that means. It's you're visiting somewhere. It says, as in a strange country, like a foreign country, dwelling in tabernacles, that's a tent, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Watch this. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I want you to keep that in mind. Verse 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, I've heard a lot of people give you know, explanations of what they think that that's talking about. It said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Well, it just told you what it was talking about. Now, when he died, did he actually get to possess that land at the moment that he died? No, it, it had, you know, even in the physical sense, he wasn't even able to take hold of the land like his descendants were later on. But that was just a picture of the true because what was he really looking for? It, it tells you. He's looking for a city, which ha, you know, a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. So people can say that Abraham didn't understand, but it tells you he understood. It tells you at least by faith he sought a city that God had made. A city that God had created. What does it mean by that God made it? Because God's there. God's the one who dwells there. He's the one who built it. It's God's house is what that's referring to. Look at verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now watch. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now, I don't know if you, if you remember a couple of these things that we read. I want you to go to Revelation 21 now. But I'm going to reread to you just to keep it fresh in your minds. There's three parallels here. Where we were at Genesis 17, Hebrews 11, and now Revelation 21. I'm going to read again to you Genesis 16 when he is talking about the fulfillment of this covenant. He says in Genesis, or I'm sorry, Genesis 17. Genesis 17, 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. You're in Revelation 21. I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 21. I want you to look at verse number 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in it. Now watch this. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So that's one fulfillment. I'm going to read again here Genesis chapter number 17, verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their gener generations for an everlasting covenant. And then he says this. To be a God unto them and to thy seed after thee. Verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Notice that. I will be their God. Look at Revelation chapter number 21. Look at verse number 1. I lost my place here. Sorry. Revelation chapter number 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Watch what it says. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Remember it said in Hebrews 11 that, that Abraham was looking for a city that was prepared by God or of God. Something along that line. Look at verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Now watch this. And be their God. That is the exact wording of Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 8. He says, he says this, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. The exact wording of Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 3. Not only that, if you remember in Hebrews chapter number 11, he talked about how he sought for a city, right? Whose builder and maker was God. But it also said that he sought for a city that had foundations. Look in Revelation chapter number 21. Look at verse number, we'll begin, we'll just start reading in verse number uh, 10. Verse number 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, uh, yeah, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. 
having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And at a wall, great and high, had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels and names <clears throat> written therein, thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the three gates, uh, on the north three gates, I'm sorry, on the three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, and then it says this, no coincidence, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Notice, in Hebrews 11 it says, he saw for city that hath foundations, plural. And then we get here to the description of Revelation chapter number 21, the exact promise that was given specifically to Abraham where he says, I will be their God, is fulfilled in Revelation 21.3. When they're getting ready to inhabit a land, the land of Canaan, referred to as Jerusalem, which is located in Canaan, and he inhabits it for an everlasting possession forever, guess who's there? The kings that came out of Abraham. Guess who's there? The kings that he spiritually begat through who also? Jesus Christ. All the nations... All of the seed innumerable, they're all there. And guess how long they're there for? Forever. Amen. An everlasting possession forever. Abraham didn't get that city or that land while he was here because that, that was just a picture. That wasn't the true fulfillment. And it tells you that he looked for a city that was prepared by God, that the builder and maker was God. Guess who made this city? God. It says he looked for a city that had foundations. And then it tells you what? It's got 12 foundations. The Bible is just, it just perfectly, everything just perfectly comes together. Amen. Just perfectly comes together over and over again. Go back to Genesis chapter number 17. So we can see the fulfillment of Genesis 17 is not like often Zionists will try to pinpoint it on the physical nation of Israel. No, it's, it's a spiritual fulfillment that will be fulfilled in the future. You know, I, I, you know, I want to mention this quickly just because it's relevant right now. And I had spoken this. I talked about this just a few weeks ago because it was relevant then as well. But Zionists will oftentimes times try to say that that promise when God is speaking to Abraham where he tells him, I'm going to give you this land to you and to your seed was fulfilled through Israel. Well, that both parts of that, it being given to Abram or Abraham and Israel are part of the same promise, Right? So it makes no sense to say, oh, it was fulfilled. You know, the land was fulfilled when the Israelites, you know, received that land. Which, it's a temporary, you know, it was a temporary fulfillment. I'll give you that, a physical fulfillment. But then to say, but then Abraham had no part of that. Well, that makes no sense because it's the same covenant. The only way that that covenant can actually, you know, make sense to be interpreted is if it's fulfilled through the seed of Christ. And that it's given to Abraham. He inhabits it and dwells in it forever, which is the land of Canaan in heaven, New Jerusalem. And then his seed, like Galatians 3 tells us, are those that are in Christ. And then they inhabit it. So then you have Abram receiving it to thee and to thy seed, singular, which is given to Christ. And all those that have faith in Christ, you know, inherit those things with Christ. Makes perfect sense. The only way that the promise makes sense. Then you have half of it being fulfilled, half of it not. And it's like that makes it... It's, all whacked out. But we allow the Bible to interpret the, to interpret the Bible? It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Then we see this, this great truth that God is actually talking about New Jerusalem in these verses. We see the kings. We see, you know, uh, him be, he says, you know, uh, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. We see that it's given as an everlasting possession, then it ends there, and I will be their God. The exact words found in Revelation 21. Amen. Great, great promise. Look at verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Now, the paragraph markers, of course, are not, um, they are not inspired. They're not a part of Scripture. But oftentimes, they're helpful. We have changed gears right now. And I want you to understand that when he says, My covenant, when he says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, we're not talking about the same covenant. We're talking now about, about circumcision he's going into right now. Because notice he says, thou shalt keep my covenant therefore. So because my covenant's with you, I want you to keep my covenant of circumcision is what he's saying. I'm going to prove that to you. Look at verse 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep. 
between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. Now notice this is two separate things. Kind of like, what is, you know what circumcision in the New Testament actually represents or epitomizes? The law. And after he's already saved, he has grace. Notice they're two separate what? Covenants. In Galatians chapter number 4, I believe it is, or maybe 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5 is actually how he, uh, you know, actually describes the man that is trusting in the law. He even says that if, even if you're trusting in circumcision, you're, not, you're a debtor to keep the whole law. He says something along that line. You know, I, I just quoted from James, but he says something along the lines that if, if you, if whosoever you be that is justified by, uh, you know, by the law, you're fallen from grace, he's talking about. But he, he's speaking specifically about a person that is, even if you just believe, he says that to a person that believes that circumcision is saving them. They're not that they were saved, but you're fallen from grace. You thought you were saved, but you you lost grip of it. You you didn't you know get get a hold of it because it's, if you were to preach this to someone, they didn't understand the gospel, and then they didn't you know end up believing it, and they tr they're trusting in circumcision. Well, obviously that person's not saved. So notice they're two separate covenants. One is circumcision. One is the gospel, isn't it? One is the law. One is grace. Two separate covenants. Now, this is just to be a figure of the first covenant, <clears throat> something very interesting about this covenant. I want you to look again at verse number 11 now. So we read verse 10, look at number 11. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Oftentimes, what is it called? The works of what? Works of the law, but also what else? The works of the flesh, which is the covenant. What is he doing? I want you to circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Notice it pertains to the flesh even, right? So he wants him, he says, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So notice it's a token. So it can't be the covenant. They can't be the same thing. If this is a token of the covenant, then it's something different. But he already established they're two separate covenants. Now, look at the next verse. This is interesting also. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man shall in your generations... In your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of, a, of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. Watch this. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. You know why? We look at Romans chapter number 4. We're not going to turn there. This is where I was going to. I anticipated turning there. But Romans chapter number 4 says that this is meant to be a sign of the other covenant. Of what? His righteousness. How long? An everlasting covenant. You know how long he had his righteousness? Forever. Never lost it. It's, it's a picture or a sign of eternal security. I've heard, uh, I know from, uh, Brother Rick and I were talking about this briefly beforehand, and I kind of alluded to it, that, that um, Reformed Baptists have a kind of a strange you know, doctrine that they teach right here about covenant theology, and I don't know all the ins and outs, so I'm not going to try to explain that to you right now behind the pulpit. But they, they think that New, Old Testament was, uh, was circumcision. New Testament is like water baptism. So I personally think that the Old Testament, right here when he got saved, we see, or he got saved when he was 86 years old or like 75 years old, when, when, uh, whenever that took place, when he believed the Lord and he accounted him for our righteousness. I believe he was 75 years old. At that moment he was saved and he was sealed. He was circumcised later. And then you know what happened when he was circumcised later? It's a, it is a, it's a sign of the other covenant, everlasting sign that he's going to have forever. Now, in the New Testament, what do we have that is our seal? The Holy Spirit, isn't it? Go to Romans 4. We are going to turn here because I can't remember. I used to have it memorized, but go to Romans 4. I want you to look at this. I want you to see how this is worded here. <clears throat> Go to, uh, look at Romans 4, where we read before, the same spot. I want you to look at verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, watch this, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. I believe that in the Old Testament, it's not circumcision, water, baptism. It's circumcision was just a figure of the Holy Spirit. Because as, as, as soon as you're saved, what happens? In the New Testament, because in the Old Testament, they didn't receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament practices were signs of things that were going to come in the New Testament. Every, and this is a part of the law. Everything in the Old Testament, the, the Lamb, that was, you know, Jesus Christ coming. All of these things pictured things to come in the New Testament. Well, 
Circumcision did too. It's not an exception, and we don't do that in the New Testament. All the things that are repealed are signs of things in the New Testament. So it's called a seal, right, in the Old Testament. And what's the seal in the New Testament? It's the Holy Spirit. And what is it meant to show? What's a seal? That it's unchanging. When he says, hey, put this in your flesh, is that something that's coming back that you can go back on? Like, hey, you know, I changed my mind. I don't want to be circumcised anymore. Not happening, right? It's too late. Same thing with being saved. If you get saved, once you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. It's like, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It doesn't matter how you feel about that, right? It doesn't, there's no going back at this point. You're saved forever. Well, the same thing. In, you're always, of course, eternal security forever. But the uh, circumcision was a picture of the coming of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it was meant to be a seal. Once you're saved, you're, it was actually meant to be a seal of eternal security. That was, the, that was actually the point of that. So that water baptism correlates not at all, period. It does, I've thought about it. It makes zero sense. The, the, uh, what makes more sense is you have the seal of the Old Testament, which just pictured the Holy Spirit to come in the New Testament. So most of the things, the practices of the Old Testament that were fleshly, they foreshadowed things that hadn't come yet also. Another reason why this makes more sense. They foreshadowed things to come, like Jesus. He wasn't born yet, was he? So he comes. Once he comes, so then the, whatever's in the Old Testament is done away with. Well, circumcision was done away. And also we have, you know, uh, when Jesus died on the cross is when a lot of those things stopped, right? Well, you have water baptism and uh, uh, water baptism being instituted before that, which I don't see any correlation with water baptism. I think that's silly. I think the clear interpretation is the Holy Spirit is, you know, circumcision was a sign or a foreshadowing, I'm sorry, of the Holy Spirit, which is the true seal. The Old Testament figures always represented the true. Look at <clears throat> verse... Oh, one other thing that's real interesting, verse 12. Um, you know, it says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. So, why does he say eight days? You know, uh, when they circumcise children today in, the, in America, they used to not do this until like... Uh, like World War I, World War II, when we had like a flooding. If you look up history, I did, you know, want somebody that's a, a, a real independent researcher. It's not Jeff Utzler, it's me. So I figured this out all on my own. You can ask my wife about this. When, when Elijah was born, you know, it had to be Elijah. He was our first son. When Elijah was born, you know, I was really looking into, uh, you know, like, Vitamin K shot, all these things I was trying to figure out, you know, what the decisions I was going to make. And I had already decided pretty much I'm not going to circumcise him. I see no reason for that. It's just a picture in the Bible. People weren't doing it before. We're told now we don't have to do it. It doesn't matter. So I'd already decided we weren't going to do that. And then I'd already, you know, you know, I was pretty much sold that, hey, we're not doing vitamin K. You can get that from, like, greens. She can eat them and then pass the vitamin K on to the child. And the reason why they, they instituted vitamin K in our country, they were both instituted or impl implemented at the same time. Circumcision, which came as a practice when the Jews migrated to our country, and then also the vitamin K shot, or maybe not in shot form at that, at that time. But I figured this out all on my own. This is super interesting. The reason why is because when they circumcised a the child, when did they do it? Eight days or immediately? Immediately, right? Well, do you know when a child is born... Their body does not coagulate properly. Does everyone know what that means? It doesn't, their blood doesn't clot. So you know what happens? They can bleed to death. You know why God said, hey, wait eight days? Because they're, you know, the, the babies are growing at a faster rate, like their cells and their systems and how they're operating, way, way more, way more so the younger they are. So their body, at, by eight days, is able to coagulate. So if they fall and get hurt or something like that, they, their blood can clot, stopping them from bleeding to death. You know, coagulation is like, it's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism that God put into the body so you don't, you know, a, a child or even an adult, they hit their head, you know, when you start, if you bleed a, a massive amount, you'll start noticing clots coming out because your body's trying, these big clots fill up, you know, the vessel's trying to stop more blood from coming out, trying to stop all the blood from pouring out of your body, Right? So a child, you know, first seven, eight days, they've discovered their body does the first seven days, I'm sorry, exactly seven days, you can look it up. Coagulation doesn't work properly in a baby. You know what God says? Circumcise on the first day, not all the way through the seventh day. You know what day you should do it? On the eighth day. Think that's a coincidence? 
No, he's the creator of the world. Amen. He understands everything. He, of course, made the body. Amen. So he knows the perfect time in which to do that. And then, you know what? So do you understand why they have to give you the vitamin K shot? Because do you know what that does, the vitamin K shot? It, it, it puts in, because there's certain minerals and, 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 and things like that, nutrition of this specific vitamin that helps the body coagulate. Helps the body, uh, the blood to clot. And it's, it comes from vitamin K, which the baby is, is deficient in that at birth. All babies. Some babies even more so than others, of course, are different levels. But all babies. So what they do is they circumcise the child and they give them the vitamin K shot. Not, I don't believe for a second that it's because, oh, we're scared that, you know, you're going to get into an accident when you're on your way home. That's what they say. No, it's because they're circumcising the child and he's bleeding profusely. That's a major surgery. I mean, they just treat it real flippantly. They just throw the baby down immediately when it's born, and they're just like cutting, mutilating the child's flesh. A serious procedure and surgery. And they don't want the children bleeding to death is what it is. That's why they do that. Because you know, they don't want to have like all these kids having... They, yeah, they may not even bleed to death, but they could have serious health issues. And a baby like that is extremely f fragile and, and vulnerable at that time. Just a little bit of problems causes bigger problems or even an illness that you have to stay there for a long period of time. It's not beneficial for their system even. So they instituted the vitamin K shot as a, as a, uh, you know, a buffer, if you will, or just you know, as a reaction to the circumcision. And then they charge you for both of them. And it became, because the Jews migrated, look it up. When all the Jews migrated in the United States of America, World War II, all, World War I, World War II, Look up when the vitamin K shot was instituted. Look up when circumcision was instituted. There's no way that's a coincidence. The medical industry is a scam. Right, right. The love of money is the root of all evil. America's not any different. They, they're, you know, they, they rake you over the coals when it comes to credit cards, when it comes to... It doesn't matter what industry you're talking about. You know, your country is not any different. There's evil people, and they institute all different types of things in the medical industry... Psychiatric drugs, it's all a sham. Sorry to tell you that, but that's the truth. You know, where you need to get all your, your information on health and things like that, the same way you get your spiritual information from, from the Bible. You know, the, the, he who created your, your body and the, the foods that you should eat, you can find tons of information about what's healthy and good for you in the Bible itself. A lot of the, a, lot, a ton of the uh, medical advice is contrary to the Bible. Tons of it. A lot of the things that God tells you to eat, you know, they're like, don't eat that, it's terrible for you, don't drink milk, don't do all these things. You know, you know what milk, specifically the Bible, this is kind of like one way off right now. Yeah, I had this prepared. You know what milk, specifically the Bible, talks about you drinking? Goat milk. Do you know goat milk, when a baby, it, uh, you know, when a, a baby's mother doesn't produce enough milk, do you know what milk that they forever, always, everyone tells them is, needs to be the substitute? goat milk before they started of course making formula you know why because it's like seven eighths or something crazy similar in parts to human milk it's like the closest and god says hey drink goat's milk why because it's the most similar to your body because it's what your body you know would need the most so you know medical advice food advice get it from the bible first go to the bible first that's where we get all of our information Amen. this is authority in all areas of our lives Look at uh, verse number 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So notice already he's laying down a foundation of a nation, isn't he? He's already telling right now Abraham, if he's not circumcised, then you need to be cut off from his people. That doesn't mean like some people have interpreted to be put to death. That's ridiculous. It means to be kicked out of like the land. Kicked out from his people is what it means. Dwelling with them. Look at verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt, know, shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. So notice, a blessing to have children. It's a blessing that she's going to be given a son. I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now, so at this point, does it look like Abraham believes what he's saying? 
somebody could say, some, somebody could look at this and say, no. Well, I believe that he believes it, just like we read before, but he, he doesn't know how it's going to work out. This feels like it's not humanly possible to him, right? Look at verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, all that Ishmael might live before thee. So notice again how Abraham's like trying to like, hey, how about this route? I know you're going to do it. How's it going to happen, right? He says, all that Ishmael like, might live before thee. This is kind of like John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist... I don't ever believe, stopped believing in God, stopped, people will have that question, you know. I don't believe that he ever stopped believing in the Bible or things like that, because uh, John the Baptist had a messenger sent to Jesus when John the Baptist was in jail, and he told the messenger to, to ask Jesus, art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Did he stop believing that there was a Christ, or that, no. He's just having doubts, isn't he? He doesn't know which, how this is going to be fulfilled. He's having doubts. He still believes, but he's kind of like, gosh, art thou he that should come? I mean, look what's going on. Is, you know, he probably did. He, I'm sure he was. But John the Baptist was no exception to not understanding the things of the Old Testament. Look at his disciples, how much trouble they had. They're looking for, they were looking for like a king, weren't they? I'm sure John the Baptist was the same. Why am I, if I'm his, the guy that comes before you, why am I in jail right now? Right? Art thou he that should come or look we for another, man? You understand what I'm saying? So he knew it was true, but he's like, how is this true with this situation? And what's very interesting is, and I didn't prepare anything on this, I'm going to be wrapping up here in a minute, is that what this actually pictured with Sarah, who did Isaac picture? Genesis 22, who did Isaac really picture? Jesus. He tells them, you know, when, when we look in the New Testament, we see that Galatians 3 tells us the promise given to Abram or Abraham. He says that it's given unto thee and thy seed. Well, who was his, his physical seed? Isaac, wasn't it? But who was that seed really referring to in the future? Jesus, wasn't it? Well, that's what we have is Isaac as being a picture of Jesus. What you have with, you know, Mary is you have her being... It's impossible for her to conceive, isn't it? It's physically impossible for her to conceive. Well, how possible do you think it was for Sarah? She's 90 years old. It's just as impossible for a 90-year-old woman to have, a, to have a baby as it is for a woman that is, that is a virgin. So do you know what this picture is as well? It's a, it's a, a type of, just like Jesus is that seed, and Isaac pictured that seed? Well, Mary, or Sarah, pictured Mary. Sarah not able to have children. You know, bringing forth Isaac, which pictured Jesus. Mary not able to have children brings forth Jesus. Right? This is actually a type or a figure of Jesus to come. So that's what this is right here. You know, uh, but keep looking in verse number, look at verse 19 now. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. <laughs> and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. <laughs> Excuse me. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make, it, make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So nine months or so, or, or a year from this point, I don't know if maybe three months went by, because he says at this set time next year, you know, uh, makes more sense that he's saying maybe three months, then she conceives, and then she has the child. He's saying right now, like a year from now, possibly, is what he's saying. I don't know if there's any specific details where you could pinpoint that more uh, uh, precisely. But look at verse number 22. It says, and he left off talking with him. This is real interesting. And God went up from Abraham. So notice God was actually there and present with Abraham. Now, it, I don't know if he was able to see him or how this worked. But let me say this. If God ever appears to anyone throughout the Bible at all, period, he always looks like the Lord Jesus Christ every single time. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the image, the definite article, the image of the invisible God. Always, every single time, if there's ever any kind of, you know, uh, theophany is what this is referred to as, or a Christophany, where God appears, or Christ appears, every time, 
They're the same thing, a theophany and a Christophany, because it's Christ appearing every single time. He looks like Jesus every time. Amen. And uh, the, the guy, the uh, one that's Pentecostal guy, he basically said that, you know, that God could appear and he could look differently. What did he say exactly? I had to, like, get the answer out of him because I knew he believed that. But I kept asking, because I've read one of his Pentecostal material. I've listened to his, their stuff before. They basically believe that he, they, God could manifest himself and look like anything, like at, at any time. He could just, like, appear and look like any man. That's super weird. Right. That's strange, man. That's super weird. It's like he could appear and look like a woman. He could appear and look like, they may say that's blasphemy, but, you know, it's just as weird to say he could just appear and look like Brother Elliot, look like Josh five minutes later. Like, he appears as the angel of the Lord. And I even asked the guy, like, what do you think he looked like? You think he looked different? He said, I think that's what he was like. Yeah, possibly, or something like that. Like, he, you know, he, he, he basically said he could appear and look like anything all throughout the Old Testament. And I told him, I said, I believe that any time anyone has ever seen God, it was Jesus. He looked like Jesus, like the man, Jesus. Why? And he's, yeah, he asked me that question, why? And the answer I just gave you. Because Jesus is the image, the image of the invisible God. If you see God, you know who you see? Jesus, every time. That's what he looks like. It's God in the flesh, and then you see him, it's Jesus. So right here, if Abram was able to look at him, you know who he saw? Jesus. Jesus is who he saw. He's the image of the invisible God. Look at verse 23. And Abraham took Ishmael. Notice it's referring to him as Abraham now. It did also before that. But Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin. Look at this. In the self-same day. So the very same day. He did this immediately. As God had said unto him. <laughs> And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Look at the obedience of him. This is not a small feat. You know, this is a big deal. You know, this is a, you know, he did this himself as well. He did this to himself. He didn't have a doctor perform this surgery. He circumcised himself and he circumcised. Remember, he, this guy's probably got hundreds of people. In one day, he circumcised all these men. I mean, you'd be tired after that too. He's got tons of servants, all of these people, and he circumcised all of them. And he's not 40 years old. He's not 30 years old. He's not a young man. And then 99 years old, he circumcised himself. I mean, you know what that shows? That shows the obedience of Abraham. It says the self-same day, that very same day, his obedience was immediately to obey. Sir, all of them, get in here. You know, imagine telling him that. I wouldn't tell him beforehand. Come on. Right? I mean, that, that just shows, though, him doing it. Is he a hypocrite? No, he's not. He brings all them in, and then he does it to himself, too. I mean, the, what a great example for us, Abraham. He's a great man. Amen. Look at verse uh, 25. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son. Look at verse 27. And all the men of his house... Born in the house and bought with money of the stranger were circumcised with him. So last point that I want to make quickly is notice that Ishmael was also circumcised with him too. What did circumcision represent? Circumcision represented the seal, right? It's, in the New Testament, it's called a seal and said that it was a seal of the everlasting covenant. It was a seal of their salvation that they would be saved forever. What's the seal? What did it re actually represent? In the New Testament, what's the seal of the New Testament? The Holy Spirit. Notice Ishmael received this too. This just destroys all of this just, you know, Muslim, Islam, bashing garbage. Yeah, they're in a false religion and people like, they just want to hate all of anybody who's Arabic. And, and you know, there's just been this culture that's created in the United States of America where anybody who's Middle Eastern that's not a Jew, just Americans just hate them. But they love Jews. They're both false religions. And you know what? Isaac ended up being circumcised too. Isaac was one of his sons. You know what? The self same day, Abraham took his other son, Ishmael, and circumcised him. Many people believe it's very possible that Ishmael is the progenitor or the father of all of the, the Arabs over there. And that's very possible. A lot of the, the Arabians and stuff, it's very possible. It talks about how he's going to be, you know, he's going to, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, be fruitful and multiply, have, he'll have many descendants. 
and how he's going to be a man of war, and how you know he's going to have his hand against hand. I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but he's going to be a man that's fighting constantly. And who fights more in the world than the Arabians, and more than those in the Middle East? That place has has been for for thousands of years just just wars constantly. There's just con if you look at where wars are fought, it's always there. Always. Look at history. Constant wars are being fought there all the time. And the Middle Easterns are always involved, constantly, all the time. Probably because it's the sins of Ishmael. But you know what? God cared just as much. God cares just about Ishmael and his descendants as he did as Isaac, his descendants as well. He wants everyone to be saved. You know, the Bible, you know when God gave the commandment, Jesus, before he, he ascended into heaven, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's everybody. You don't have your preference between, oh, I'd really like to get a Jew saved. You know, a Muslim's just as important to get saved. They're both false religions. They're both just as important. We need to care about everybody equally. You know, race is, is not something mentioned in the Bible. It's a human race. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, your love, that you love all of us. Dear God, and that you're, you're not an unfair or respecter of persons, but that you, you love, uh, love all of your creation, dear Lord. You want us all to be saved. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for Abraham as a great example for us, and Sarah also as a, as a great example as well. Thank you for the great stories and all of the, the interesting things that we can learn from of circumcision representing the, the seal of, of our righteousness, which represents the, the seal in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit. Just be with us and bless us. Help our church to grow. Dear God, and we ask you that you would uh, be with those that, uh, that are, are endeavoring to, to move to our church right now. And just continue to bless our church and help it to grow. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.